Hello everyone, and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. In our previous lecture, we discussed some properties of neutron and nuclear cross-sections, and today we're going to expand on this subject by discussing exactly what cross-sections are and how they're measured. First, let's discuss what cross-sections look like, and what physics properties and phenomena govern their behavior. In general, neutron cross-sections can be divided into four main regions as a function of energy. This energy, again, is the instant energy of the neutrons that interact with the nucleus. The four main energy regions of cross-sections are, in order of increasing energy, the 1 over V region, the resolved resonance region, the unresolved resonance region, and the high energy or fast region. Let's discuss these four regions and let's do it out of order. The first region we'll discuss is the resolved resonance region. From quantum mechanics, we know that matter can behave both as a particle and also as a wave. At various energies, the wavelength of neutrons can correspond to an excitation energy for nucleons in the nucleus's nuclear shell. In this case, the wavelength of these neutrons is said to resonate with the nucleus. When this kind of perfect resonance exists, the nucleus will readily absorb the neutron if it comes anywhere within range. The cross-section for these resonance energy neutrons peaks to a value that is several orders of magnitude greater than non-resonance cross-sections, which means that nuclei essentially act as black holes to any resonance energy neutrons that they encounter. They gobble up these neutrons whenever they encounter them. As we'll see later, a great deal of nuclear engineering focuses on accounting for, modeling, and characterizing these resonances. The next region we'll discuss is the unresolved resonance region. The difference between the resolved and unresolved resonance regions is that the resolved resonances are sufficiently far apart that we can distinguish between individual resonances and measure their cross-sections individually. As the energy of an instant neutron increases, so does the number of ways that a neutron can resonate with the target nucleus. In the unresolved resonance region, these nuclear excitation resonances have become so plentiful that we cannot identify or measure resonance cross-sections individually. Instead, we must model on nuclear models and statistical tables to predict and randomly sample whether a neutron is at a resonance energy for a specific nucleus. The cutoff energy between the unresolved and resolved resonance region varies based on the resolution of cross-section measurements and across different cross-section evaluations and it often changes between different revisions of cross-section libraries. The next cross-section region we'll discuss is the fast or high energy region. In this fast region, the energy of the neutron has increased to the point where the unresolved resonances don't need to be sampled anymore. Resonances still exist at these energies, but they've become so plentiful that we can smear the resonances together and treat the cross-sections as smooth functions of energy. The fourth cross-section region we'll discuss is the 1 over V, or thermal, energy region. At low energies, cross-sections follow a 1 over V distribution, where V is the velocity of the neutron. Using the definition of kinetic energy, we can show that this energy distribution is also equivalent to a 1 over square root of E distribution. The cross-sections follow this shape because, believe it or not, there are also neutron resonances at negative energies and the tails of these resonances assume a 1 over V distribution. You thought that we were free of resonances in this energy range, and in fact, we are always hopelessly at the mercy of resonances. The secret fifth and final cross-section region describes the background cross-section. Some reactions, such as potential scatter, are relatively constant as a function of energy, and aren't really impacted by nuclear resonances. In this case, our cross-section evaluation will require some background cross-section to be added to the resonance-dependent cross-sections. If you've spent much time looking at neutron cross-sections, and looking at these resonances in particular, then you've probably noticed that there are sometimes little dips right below a resonance peak. These dips aren't an artifact of cross-section plotting tools. They actually exist, and they occur when P-wave elastic scattering resonance cross-sections interfere destructively with the constant potential scattering cross-section. When this happens, the overall cross-section at these energies can drop to very, very small values, and in the case of Iron 56's 24 keV resonance, the cross-section actually drops to zero due to this destructive interference. 
This is known as the iron window because iron's zero bar and cross section at 24 keV allows neutrons at this energy to leak through any shielding. The iron window has significant consequences, and it actually affects how reactors perform shielding calculations, often forcing them to rely on slower but higher fidelity methods. We'll discuss this concept again when we discuss multigroup cross sections. Cross sections are generally expressed in units of barns, represented by the symbol B, where one barn equals 10 to the negative 24 centimeters squared. This unit has strange and interesting origins, which date all the way back to the Manhattan Project. If nuclear engineers spend enough time in a social setting, they will invariably revert to discussing work, especially if they've been imbibing. This is true today, and it was true in Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project, where weapons scientists struggled to find ways to discuss top-secret projects in bars and restaurants in Los Alamos without revealing classified information. Eventually, these scientists decided it was best to speak in a code when discussing their work, which led them to develop the shake, as in shakes of a lamb's tail, to describe units of time, and the barn, as in being able to hit the broadside of a barn, to describe the cross-section of fissile nuclei. These units persist to this day, and their meaning has been declassified and is commonly used among almost all nuclear engineers. Moving on, students often wonder where cross-sections come from. It's tempting to assume that cross-sections are known quantities and to treat them like a black box when performing simulations. But in truth, cross-sections are constantly being measured, tweaked, and re-evaluated. Thus, it's worthwhile to discuss how we measure cross-sections. There are two classes of measurements that we use for cross-sections, differential measurements and integral measurements. In short, differential measurements will actually measure cross-sections, while integral measurements confirm the accuracy of differential cross-section measurements and evaluations. Differential measurements measure cross-sections by using neutron time-of-flight filtering on some neutron source. This neutron source is often an accelerator-driven spallation source, which accelerates protons into some target material to knock out or spallate several neutrons on impact. If we know the exact time at which the neutrons are born in this target, then the time it takes them to travel from the target to some other point depends on their kinetic energy. This relationship gives us a time of flight dependent and energy dependent neutron flux at this other point. If we place a sample at this point and measure its reaction rate, then we have a time-dependent reaction rate that is thus dependent on the energy of our neutrons. Since we know the thickness of our sample, this gives us energy-dependent cross-section measurements. These differential measurements often produce noisy data, as shown here, and nuclear data scientists must evaluate these cross-sections, which means to fit physics model parameters to the noisy data and to adjust these model parameters until the data produce accurate simulation results. The energy corresponding to the peak of neutron resonances is just one example of the model parameters that nuclear data scientists must fit to differential data. So differential measurements are differential because this multitude of noisy points produce cross-section measurements at very small, almost differential, energy intervals. In contrast, integral measurements test the accuracy of cross-sections by integrating the differential data to measure more macro-scale observable parameters, such as a system's eigenvalue or energy integrated reaction rates in some activation foil. If computational simulations, such as those from the MCMP Monte Carlo code, produce results that match these integral experiment measurements, then it provides confidence that our nuclear data are accurate and that we can accurately predict the behavior of similar kinds of systems. If these simulated and experimental measurements don't match, then it's a sign that the nuclear data need to be tweaked. This tweaking process introduces some correlations between the nuclear data and the integral benchmark experiments, and most nuclear data evaluation methods currently ignore this correlation. This is a bit beyond the scope of this course, but treating these correlations is the subject of ongoing research. Okay, so now that we've measured our differential cross-sections, evaluated the cross-sections by fitting physics model parameters to the differential measurements, and have confirmed the accuracy of our cross-sections using integral experiment measurements, how do our modeling and simulation codes use this cross-section data? More so, how is this data structured and stored so that it can be used by our codes? 
There are two general approaches for storing cross-section data. We can either store it in a continuous energy format or in a multigroup format. The continuous energy, which is often referred to as CE format, uses a large number of data points to represent our cross-section's energy-dependent behavior. Most CE data libraries use somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 data points to represent each cross-section for each reaction in each nuclide. This method uses so many points to represent the cross-section data that you can actually linearly interpolate between any two points and obtain accurate cross-section estimates. Yes, this linear interpolation introduces some level of error and some level of approximation, but in practice this error is much smaller than the amount of uncertainty present in our differential measurements and in our physics model parameter evaluations. So in short, continuous energy data libraries represent the cross-sections by using so many data points that the data are as close to exact as possible. Because of this exactness, the highest fidelity nuclear engineering codes, such as Monte Carlo codes, all use continuous energy data representations. The downside to continuous energy data representations is that our 10 to 100,000 data points requires a large amount of computational memory storage. Most continuous energy libraries require several gigabytes of memory. And while several gigabytes isn't much of a problem for our personal computers, this memory footprint can become troublesome when performing simulations on massively parallel supercomputers, especially when those supercomputers use low memory GPU units. The alternative to continuous energy data representations is the multigroup approximation. As shown here, the multigroup format averages continuous energy data into several coarse energy groups. Typically they use something like 2 or 44 or 56 or 238 or 252 groups, depending on the code that we're running and its simulation goals. If we do a really good job of averaging our continuous energy cross-sections, then this coarse multigroup format will still produce accurate simulation results, and it will net us a huge reduction in memory requirements and actually a large decrease in the simulation's runtime. This is because it's much, much faster for a computer to look up some value that's in a 44 element array compared to a value that's in a 100,000 element array. The catch to all of this is that we need to make sure that our multi-group cross-sections when used in our codes produce accurate simulation results. This is much easier said than done. In fact, one of the primary goals of reactor physicists is developing schemes to generate accurate multigroup cross-section representations. We'll discuss how to generate multigroup cross-sections in much greater detail later on in this course. The last topic that we'll discuss today is Doppler broadening, which is perhaps the most important physics phenomenon in reactor physics and is perhaps the most significant factor that allows us to control and operate reactors. Without Doppler broadening, reactors might be untamable beasts. So what is Doppler broadening? Well, consider a neutron that is heading toward some target nucleus. Cross-section for this neutron describes a probability that this neutron will interact with the nucleus, but this assumes that the nucleus is stationary and that only the neutron is moving. In reality, the target nucleus is vibrating based on its temperature, and these small vibrations make the neutron think that it's heading towards a nucleus at either a slightly faster or slightly slower velocity, depending on if the nucleus is randomly vibrating towards or away from the neutron. This vibration-induced smearing of cross-sections changes our cross-section resonances from narrow, tall peaks into shorter and more broad distributions. This cross-section broadening is known as Doppler broadening. Doppler broadening is more significant for lower energy neutrons because their energy is closer to the thermal energy of the target nucleus. Eventually, for faster and faster neutrons, Doppler broadening becomes insignificant because for these faster neutrons, the nucleus effectively looks stationary. Also, the degree to which the resonances broaden depends on the temperature of the target material. Hotter materials allow for more thermal motion in the target nuclei, which makes the resonance peaks more broad compared to in colder materials. The nuclear data in this figure here become more and more broad as the temperature of the target material increases. The integral of these resonance cross-sections stays the same regardless of how much they are Doppler broadened, but the number of neutrons absorbed by these resonances changes dramatically. In general, 
shorter, broader resonances will absorb more neutrons, which means that higher temperature materials tend to absorb more neutrons than colder materials. This results in an important safety mechanism in reactors. As reactors heat up and their cross-sections broaden, the reactor materials tend to absorb more neutrons, which lowers the reactivity that's present for the fission chain reaction. Essentially, when your reactor gets too hot, it will shut itself down. This phenomenon is also described by reactivity feedback coefficients, which is a concept that we will briefly discuss when we cover reactor kinetics. But for now, we can summarize this safety feature by stating that reactors actually shut themselves down as their temperature increases, which prevents most kinds of runaway fission chain reactions from occurring. We'll discuss one notable exception to this safety feature, the Chernobyl reactor accident, in the final lecture of this course. This concludes our discussion of cross-sections. We didn't discuss many mathematical concepts today, but most of the material that you learned today will either come back later on in this course, or is just plain helpful to know as a nuclear engineer. In the next few lectures, we will review the physics of nuclear fission before moving on to scattering kinematics.